Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Jerusalem and to the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies. It's a great pleasure to host you here um, today. Uh, well, the Institute is one of, of many institutes for advanced studies uh, around the world, but it's not like all the other institutes. It's the best one. Um, <laughs> But uh, um, like other institutes, we host uh, research groups and we host individual fellows. But the things we like best to host is the uh, uh, schools for advanced studies that we are having. And in that respect, we are unique because no other institute around the world hosts so many uh, schools for advanced studies. We have six of them each year. And this is the 33rd uh, uh, um, in, uh, advanced school in uh, economic theory. And I'm grateful to the organizers, uh, Professor Eric Maskin, uh, Professor Elhanan Ben Porat, and P Professor Michael Woodford for uh, uh, organizing this fantastic uh, school and what seems to be a, a, a great program. Um, but I want to share with you a, a, a small anecdote I had um, two years ago in one of the um, meetings of the directors of Institutes for Advanced Studies from all over the world. The director of the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies came to me and said, you know, when I was uh, a young student, I was at a, an advanced school at your institute, and it was a formative stage in my career. Well, he's not the director of the Princeton Institute anymore because he is now the uh, Minister of Education in the Netherlands. So I just want to hope that one of you will someday become the director of the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies or the Minister of Education in your countries. So please enjoy your stay here and uh, the fruitful program that you have in all I have to wish you is, is a good time in Jerusalem and, and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Maskin. I'm uh, the director of the Economic Summer School. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to uh, thank the people who, who have done the hard work. Uh, in particular, uh, Elhanan Ben Parat, who uh, uh, many of you will have been in contact with. Um, we could not have this school were it not for Elhanan. Uh, and uh, uh, Mike Woodford, who, who will be uh, lecturing later today. Uh, the topic this year is one that I'm very much interested in, but I am not by any means an expert. And it was wonderful to be able to rely on someone who is an expert uh, to discuss uh, what topics we should cover, what, who the lecturers should be, and so on. So, so many thanks, Mike. And um, just, just a few words about the... Uh, about the school, uh, it's pretty intense. We're gonna have something like 22 or 23 lectures over the course of the next 10 days. Uh, but you shouldn't really regard them as formal lectures. The, the tradition of this school is that there should be a lot of interaction. There normally is a lot of interaction. Questions, comments, uh, corrections, th those, are, those are important, uh, and complaints, of course, if, if things are, are not going to your, to your liking. Uh, so I hope you will feel free at any time to, to interject. Uh, that, that, that's important. And, and also important is what goes on in between lectures. Uh, there'll be a lot of time, a lot of coffee breaks, a lot of downtime for, uh, for further discussion. Uh, the, the lecturers are all prepared to 
talk to you about your work, about their work, about the lectures themselves. I hope you'll take advantage of, of the time to, uh, to uh, have lots of conversations. Uh, and, and of course, uh, toward the end of the school, there will be a poster session where I hope many of you will uh, prepare presentations for, for discussion. I, I always especially enjoy those sessions because it's a chance to see a lot of interesting work uh, presented uh, in, a, in a compact and uh, accessible forum. Uh, so that's, um, that's what I hope will happen. Uh, just a word about the, uh, the history of the school. As, as Yitzhak said, this is actually the, uh, the 33rd uh, edition of the Economic Summer School. It started in 1990, and it's run every year but one, it, which was a pandemic year, uh, since then. Uh, the first 18 years were under the direction of Kenneth Arrow, who stepped down uh, after 2007, and I've been doing it since then, and I'm trying to equal Ken's record. He, he, he was there for 18 years. This is gonna be my 15th, so I'm almost there. Uh, <laughs> depending on what happens this year, I may or may not continue. Uh, anyway, um, I will come back in a few minutes and, and, and talk uh, about hyper, hyperbolic discounting, but let me turn it over for now to Elkanon, who uh, will fill in the details that I haven't mentioned. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Uh, welcome to the 33rd School in Economic Theory. Eric and Mike have prepared for us a beautiful program. So we are in for a stimulating school. By the way, the number of uh, students who've registered this year is exceptionally high, which indicates a, a strong interest in the topic and in the program. <laughs> so we are very happy, uh, we are very happy about that. Um, time is short, so just a few comments. First, I'll just quickly reiterate what Eric said. This is a school and we encourage and cherish interaction, uh, and both during the lectures, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, our experience is clear about this. It makes the lectures more interesting and more lively. And of course, you're welcome to talk with the speakers uh, uh, during the breaks as well. Now, uh, uh, you might no, not know that, but the group of students, I went over your files, and I can tell you that the group of students that's sitting here is a remarkable group. So take this opportunity to get to know each other, because you have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, and uh, that, that would be most valuable uh, as well. Um, two uh, quick logistical comments. We will have breaks and lunch at the ground floor. If you have any logistical issue, we have a nut here uh, that will help in any matter. And this is an opportunity to give you a big, big thank you, Anat, for all the hard work you've done. Yes, I, I want to thank you, Anat, as well. Uh, uh, again, probably many of you have interacted with her, and uh, uh, for logistical arrangements, she is uh, is truly a master. So I'm. Uh, and it's a whole team. Well, it's a whole team. It's a team, but um, the whole team deserves uh, thanks and congratulations. <laughs> Okay, uh, so let's let's get to um, to.
to the first lecture in the, in the school, uh, evolution and uh, hyperbolic discounting. Oh, I, I should mention that uh, if we're following past practice, uh, all of the lecture slides, and I think the videos of the lectures themselves will be posted uh, on the Institute website. So uh, those of you who are taking notes, uh, adjust accordingly because a lot of the material will, will already be there for you. So as, as you all know, because you're here, uh, we're interested this summer in behavior that is not fully rational in the traditional economic sense of rationality, by, by which I mean uh, decisions that maximize some objective function given the decision maker's beliefs about the consequences of those decisions. And furthermore, um, there are restrictions on beliefs as well. We, we, we normally, uh, we normally assume, if we're talking about a rational decision maker, that beliefs come from uh, Bayesian updating. So there's some prior distribution. Decision makers learn from experience and they update those priors uh, accordingly using, using Bayes' rule. Uh, so that's, that's what rationality is, but we know from many different sources uh, that a lot of behavior uh, is not rational, in the, or not fully rational in this sense, and we know furthermore that the, the irrationalities or the departures from full rationality uh, are uh, often systematic. That is, we can predict in advance how people will depart from the, from the, from the classical rationality model. Uh, so, be, so behavior is not arbitrary. It comes from somewhere. And the point of view I want to take uh, in this first session is that uh, this behavior comes from, from evolution, or at least some of the behavior comes from evolution. There will also be a, uh, a learning component. Uh, in other words, why do we behave the way we do? It's because uh, we have been subjected to the same circumstances in the past. Uh, and we and, and certain behaviors uh, worked well then, and so they carry over today. Uh, and for the most part today, I'm actually going to be interested in uh, biological evolution. So we're talking about evolution that is uh, imprinted uh, in our, the, the, e the evolutionary forces work uh, through uh, genetic uh, transmission. And the particular behavior that I want to focus on uh, is an important phenomenon uh, in behavioral economics, it has been for, for many years now, uh, called hyperbolic discounting or present biased behavior. Uh, I imagine that many of you are familiar with this. If not, don't worry, because we will be talking about it in detail. But uh, the argument I want to make is that we, can, we, we will see how we can understand why people should behave in this uh, hyperbolically discounting fashion uh, as a response uh, to 
optimization problems that come up over and over again. So, so evolution is the exp explanation for this behavior. Now, uh, uh, Bob Alman, who is uh, here in the first row today, will be coming toward the end of the school to talk about evolutionary explanations for a variety of other well-known behaviors in the behavioral economics literature. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on hyperbolic discounting. So, uh, so what is hyperbolic discounting? Uh, b before we get to uh, hyperbolic discounting, let's spend a, a moment on uh, just simple discounting. What, 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 does, what does that mean? It means uh, that uh, we put less weight on future payoffs than we do on uh, current payoffs. Uh, and by the way, uh, this is not only true for, for our species, but it's true uh, for uh, a variety of animal species that have also been studied. Um, and I'm, I, I'm going to tell you about some very interesting uh, studies on pigeons and starlings uh, that uh, uh, give some quite striking uh, results connected to discounting and, and more particularly to hyper, hyperbolic discounting um, a bit later on. So many species discount. Uh, we know from experimental work and other, other evidence uh, that some species discount in a way that uh, as a as a particular payoff gets nearer to us in time, some future payoff gets nearer to us, the, the, the time has shrunk between now and the future, uh, we tend to uh, discount those payoffs more. The, this, this is uh, this is the essence of hyperbolic discounting. And uh, if anything, the evidence for this kind of behavior is even better in birds than it is for humans. And that's why I want to concentrate uh, later on on the, uh, on the pigeon and starling uh, evidence. Uh, but let's, let's start with, uh, with an observation from uh, almost 70 years ago uh, that got uh, hyperbolic, the interest in hyperbolic discounting going. Uh, Strotz uh, made the observation uh, that every year, uh, and he was he was looking at Americans, but similar things go on elsewhere in the world. Uh, every year, it, it seemed people wanted to uh, save or made a resolution to save for, um, for Christmas or other holidays and at, toward the end of the year. They, they would even lay money aside for these holidays. Uh, but then uh, what often happened was that their intentions were thwarted by other things that came along. Uh, so the possibility of a summer vacation would come up, or people would, students would realize that, or their parents would realize that students needed uh, clothes to go back to school, and so uh, the savings that were made 
for Christmas ended up getting used for uh, other matters along the way. Uh, and this gave rise, Strokes uh, noted, to uh, what are called Christmas accounts. Christmas accounts were, um, were very strange savings accounts where you put money in the account you got no interest on it. And furthermore, uh, it, was, it was a completely illiquid investment. That is, once you put your money in, you couldn't get it back, except with a very large penalty, until Christmas. And, and this was a way of forcing yourself not to use up the money too soon. Uh, now, Rational people shouldn't need an illiquid and non-interest bearing account like this, but uh, Strotz was interested to see that Christmas accounts, at least when he was writing in, in the 50s, were very popular. Now eventually, Christmas accounts were destroyed by the, uh, by, uh, the credit card. Pe people found that they were able to pay for this stuff and uh, not actually have to fork any money over for months by maxing out on their credit cards. But uh, that was not so easy to do uh, when, when Strotz was writing. Uh, I'll come back to Christmas accounts later. But uh, in effect, if, if you've put money in a Christmas account and then you decide to spend the money on uh, a vacation, say, uh, you have, in effect, become more impatient. So that, Strotz was writing about uh, positive payoffs, things that, that we look forward to. Uh, another notable paper by O'Donohue and Rabin looked at uh, not such pleasant uh, future events. Uh, they looked at um, how people plan to pay their taxes. And again, they were, they were focused on uh, American tax paying. Uh, they noted that many people in February, looking ahead to uh, April 15th, which is the American tax deadline, uh, many people in February would resolve to do their taxes early. Doing them at the last minute is extremely painful because how are you going to make sure that you have all of the, the necessary paperwork in front of you? So it's much better to do it earlier, say on uh, April 1st, where it's going to be maybe a five-hour task, uh, rather than doing it on April 15th, uh, when it's going to be even more painful and even more uh, time-consuming. Uh, so. The authors noted that, that a, a very large fraction of people resolved in February that they would do their taxes early. Uh, but as April 1st got closer and closer, many of those uh, resolutions faded away and people would tend to postpone uh, until April 15th. Most, most people. Uh, so, in effect, they too are discounting later pain more as time grows shorter. By the way, there haven't been any yeah, questions. Yes. Okay, good. That may 
also make a difference. Uh, uh, O'Donohue and Rabin were looking at people who, had, who, who, who were net owers. Uh, uh, I can't remember whether they looked at what happened if, if, if you thought you were getting well, it doesn't a matter return. because the well, payment is the effort that you exert. No, and it's also to get, to get a, to get a big, a big bunch of money regarding yeah. the working yeah. out the paperwork. Doing the paperwork. That's, what, that's one thing. The other is to, to get the payment from, from the tax authority, that's an awesome. And you get it earlier. You do, uh, uh, okay. and, and I, do, I just can't remember. I don't. I don't think O'Donoghue and Raven looked at uh, at what happens with refunds, but they might have. And, and as Al mentioned, that could that could also be incorporated into the uh, into the framework. But uh, but the point I'm making is that this discounting applies both to uh, benefits and costs. Yes. Right, but, but the essence of, uh, of hyperbolic discounting is that uh, payoffs in the farther future are discounted less. So, it, so in February, both April 1st and April 15th are in the far future. So they're going to be discounted at a reasonably similar rate. Uh, and, and therefore, since the cost is higher in April 15th, people will opt for April 1st. But once we get close to April 1st, the discounting for April 15th becomes much bigger than that for April 1st. And so now, April 1st looks better than April 15th. So why, why are we interested in, in hyperbolic discounting? Uh, well, economists are interested in it because uh, what typically happens, it, it's not just saving for Christmas that people can't do, it's saving for retirement. Uh, in most countries, most people don't save enough for retirement, even though they know they should be saving, uh, because too many other spending opportunities come along. And for that reason, many, many countries have uh, instituted social security uh, programs, which uh, in one, one way of looking at social security is as social insurance, but another way of looking at it is it's, it's a way of forcing you uh, in a sort of paternalistic way to uh, save at least something for your retirement. And how do we rationalize this? How do policymakers rationalize it? Well, they rationalize it on the basis of hyperbolic discounting. So as I said, I, I, I want to look at, um, a, at an evolutionary explanation for hyperbolic discounting. Uh, and the idea is that uh, a lot of our behavior is guided not just by uh, calculation, but by our, uh, our preferences, our, our, our cravings or our urges or our instincts. Uh, and these preferences or uh, instincts 
have evolved to help make the animal make the right decision uh, in typical situations that the animal faces. So uh, the, the typical situation that I want to concentrate on is one where there is uncertainty about when payoffs will be realized. And, and as you will see, uh, in those situations, uh, we can expect to get the sort of preference reversals people first choosing April 1st and then switching to April 15th uh, consistent with uh, hyperbolic discounting. Uh, Right. That's absolutely right. And, and that's why the behavior turns out to be inappropriate. That is, we, uh, the, the, the argument that I want to make is that uh, our urges, our, our impulses evolved in a setting where there was uncertainty, oh, okay. and then when, uh, and then when ap applied to a modern world where we have to pay taxes on April fifteenth, turns out to be inappropriate. So it's not, it's, it's not appropriate for the. For Yes, that's right. Exactly, that's right. Uh, and 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 the the experiments on pigeons bring this out precisely. Pigeons at, are used to a world where future payoffs are are really quite uncertain, not just about their magnitude, but also about the time that they will be realized. And when you put a pigeon into a situation where there's no uncertainty about when payoffs are realized, it no longer behaves uh, optimally. It no longer behaves what? It, optimally. Optimally. Right. It, it thinks or it behaves, it behaves as though that's right. Right. No That's right. That's right. That's right. But as, as we will see, there is a corrective mechanism. Just as people can correct their inability to save for Christmas by putting their money into a Christmas account, pigeons can do something like that too. But we're getting ahead of the story. So I, I, I think that question, which is, which is a good question, uh, might be taken up when we, when we get to the data on pigeons. 
I, I'm, ac I'm not actually going to talk much about human data, uh, but, the, uh, but there, there, there were some remarkable pigeon studies done, uh, which, which in a sense are much better because, because these, are, these can be much more carefully controlled about things that pigeons really care about, food, uh, than, than we can hope for with, it, with human experiments. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, um, those experiments do not reveal future bias. Uh, the idea that we would switch from uh, an earlier payoff to a later payoff. Uh, the, the, they show quite clearly that you get reversals in the other direction, but not toward the farther future. So, so let, let, me, let me explain uh, why, we why we would expect uncertainty about when payoffs are realized to give us something that looks like hyperbolic discounting. So imagine that, that you're a decision maker and you're offered a choice between um, two prospects. Uh, one has a relatively small payoff, but the payoff is realized relatively soon, and the other prospect has a bigger payoff, uh, but is realized uh, later in the future. Uh, but the twist we're going to make is that for either prospect, there is some probability in any instant that the payoff will be realized uh, in that next instant. Uh, so there's a, uh, a small but positive probability of early realization. There can also be a small but positive, positive probability of late realization, but that doesn't play uh, a role in the analysis. It's the early realization that, that is important. Now let's, let's imagine that you originally choose uh, the later prospect with the bigger payoff, P prime. And perhaps one of the reasons why you, you choose P prime is because it might be realized early. Uh, but as time goes on, and there is no realization, your chance of getting an early payoff is going down. <coughs> now that's also true of the other prospect, the P prospect, but the other prospect pays off less anyway. So the fact that you have lost some uh, chance of early realization is more important for the P prime prospect than for, for, the P, for the P prospect. In other words, the P prime prospect looks worse now relative to P than it did at the outset. And so at some point, you might say, well, I'm, I'm going to switch to P. And that is, uh, that's the sort of behavior that we would expect with hyperbolic discounting. Uh, I'm, I'm going to flesh out this intuition. Th this intuition is, is correct, but, and I'm going to make it more uh, precise uh, in a little while. But th this is the rough idea. Now, the the
it because it's proportional to the payoff size, and P prime has a bigger payoff. So suppose, suppose these payoffs are food, and uh, you need calories in order to survive. Now, of course, you're going to discount future calories because they, they come later. But once you, once you have made that adjustment, your probability maximizing option your, your survival maximizing option is the one that uh, gives you the highest uh, expected payoff. Okay. Now there's a there's a problem with what I've ju just said. We we do get a switch at some point from the P prime prospect, the later prospect, to the earlier prospect. That, that, that looks like hyperbolic discounting. But there's no um, dynamic inconsistency. It's not as though uh, the, the bird is saying to itself, oh, uh, I know I'm going to. Uh, switch later on, and I really don't want to do that, how can I prevent myself from switching? Uh, the, uh, the switch is actually payoff maximizing. It's optimal for the decision maker to switch from P prime to P. And that's because of the change in probability of early realization. Uh, but this, this is where we come to atypical choice problems. Let's suppose we put a pigeon in a, in a setting where there's no probability of early realization. Uh, it doesn't know that. Uh, it's going to behave as though it were in the typical situation, and it's going to make this switch, and that will be a mistake. So the urge to switch may lead the, the pigeon astray. And this right here is the, is the main point of, um, of the paper. Uh, but it, it goes farther than that because uh, it turns out that pigeons eventually realize that they're in this atypical setting, they can't do anything <laughs> about, their, about their preferences, their urges. Th those, those are baked in. But they, they can take steps to circumvent their own urges. And, and th they're, they're really very clever about that. We'll, we'll, we'll see what they do uh, later on. So what I'm getting at is that decision makers may actually learn how to overcome their, their impatience. OK. Um, so let's back up a little bit. Uh, why, should, why should pigeons uh, discount at all? Why should we discount it all? Uh, there, there, are, there are basically two reasons. Uh, one reason, which goes back to, uh, to Menachem Yari in the 1960s, is that you're waiting for a future payoff, 
uh, it may not be realized at all, or even if it is realized, it may, it may depreciate. Uh, so from the point of view of, um, of birds, let's, let's imagine you're, you're a bird, a starling or a pigeon, and you're waiting for the fruits on, on a raspberry bush to ripen. Uh, there's no point in eating the fruit now because if it's not ripe, it doesn't have um, sufficient calories. Uh, problem is that as you're waiting, it, it could be that a flock of crows will come along and eat up the raspberries. Crows uh, can make more of these raspberries, these unripe raspberries, than, than you can. So uh, you as the starling should take account of the fact that the raspberries actually might be, might be gone. Uh, and you should discount uh, those payoffs uh, according to uh, the probability uh, that the crows uh, arrive in any particular time interval. Uh, if if crows are, are the main threat to your getting these raspberries, uh, it's that hazard rate or that probability uh, that will determine your discount rate. Now, actually, this, this story uh, underlying discounting actually gives us a, uh, a potential a cheap explanation for hyperbolic discounting, because if the uh, hazard rate uh, is declining in time, that is, if, if future time intervals have a lower probability of crows eating raspberries than uh, the farther in the future they are, uh, then, um, then indeed, uh, you are um, in a hyper, hyperbolic discounting setting, uh, but there are there are two problems uh, with using this approach, a declining hazard rate, to to try to uh, establish hyperbolic discounting. Uh, the first is uh, there's no particular reason why the, uh, why the hazard rate should be declining. Mike. That's, that's a good point. Uh, but that brings me to the, uh, to the second reason why this is not going to work. Uh, yeah. Another thing, if you place crows by a force, that kills the crow. Oh, and sure. That has, that has a high probability at the, uh, uh, yeah. you know, early, but then the probability goes down. The uh, because, because of time, you know, early in the season, I mean, early in the winter, let's say, which is what some people call it, Yeah. Yeah, but, but but that might be counteracted by the fact that as we've moved farther into the spring, the probability that crows will come around is higher. So, so who knows? Uh, there 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 are many effects going in different directions. The the one that Mike pointed out is right. The frost is right, but there are there are forces moving in the other direction. There's no particular, uh, there's no particular reason why on average uh, discount, discount rate should be uh, declining. Uh, but even if they were, 
we shouldn't expect um, preference reversals as a result. That is, we get a preference reversal from P prime to P because as, as we approach uh, the time when we're expecting P to be realized, we have changed the relative discounting of those two prospects. But if the hazard rate is coming down uh, for, for these other reasons anyway, that, uh, that doesn't cause us to uh, reevaluate the discounting of P versus P prime. In other words, there's no, uh, there's no dynamic inconsistency generated uh, by the decline in the discount rate. So this easy story is not going to be sufficient. Now there's another important reason for discounting, which is that uh, to wait for future payoffs uh, can be costly. Uh, if, if we're talking about uh, payoffs which deliver calories, uh, well, if you're waiting for future calories, in the meantime, you are burning calories, so there's a, so there's a physiological cost to waiting. And furthermore, uh, if you are concentrating on this raspberry bush, uh, you are presumably foregoing the opportunity to pursue other options. In other words, there's an opportunity cost involved in, in waiting for the raspberries to ripen. Uh, and so for both those reasons, um, uh, waiting costs uh, will be important as well. It's not just the fact that the payoffs might disappear. And uh, one reason for uh, focusing on waiting costs is that uh, they do help explain uh, an interesting empirical regularity, at least one that comes, uh, that, that applies to, to birds, which is that um, large payoffs uh, tend to be discounted less. Uh, and what I mean by that is, let's look at two, our two prospects, uh, P and, and P prime. Uh, and suppose that uh, a decision maker, given the choice, uh, chooses P, the earlier prospect, If we now replace the payoffs, V and V prime, uh, with a uh, scaled up version, so KV prime, KV, uh, that's actually going to tend to get decision makers to move toward the later prospect. So big, bigger prospects uh, seem to generate more patience. Uh, and, and that follows immediately from the, from the waiting cost story because uh, the waiting costs themselves are not going to be proportional to the payoffs. Uh, so that if, we, if, if the decision maker initially went for the earlier prospect, but we now multiply the payoffs by this scalar k, bigger than one, um, eventually uh, the later prospect is going to be, is going to be preferred. So that's, that's one reason for, uh, for looking at waiting costs uh, as well as uh, the possibility of payoffs uh, depreciating or, or disappearing. But in, in fact, um, 
what I'm going to do is to focus on, on the hazard rate uh, story uh, because the waiting cost story ends up being more or less the same. So uh, I've already explained the main idea. We're, we're going to introduce some uncertainty uh, about uh, the realization time. Uh, the, the starling might be pretty sure that the raspberries will be ripe tomorrow uh, from, based on past experience. Uh, but, um, but there's some chance that they will ripen uh, earlier or, or later. Uh, and the way that we'll, that we'll model this is to suppose that uh, in any, uh, at any time, if we look at the interval delta t, uh, there's some probability uh, proportional to delta t that the raspberries will, will ripen in that, in that interval. So, so Q here uh, is, uh, Q is the probability of, of early realization. Uh, and that means that uh, the overall uh, expected payoff, which, which is the thing that the, that the bird is trying to maximize, bec because this is directly related to survival, uh, is, an, is an expression like this, where the, the first term um, is the payoff from early realization. Uh, the raspberries could ripen any time between zero and t. And the second term is the payoff from the raspberries ripen, ripening just when expected at capital T. I'm going to leave off the third term, which is what happens if the raspberries ripen after capital T, again, because that plays uh, no significant role in the analysis. It's the early ripening which, which uh, is of interest here. So a any questions about that, uh, that objective function? Yes, I, I'm going to I'm going to assume that that, that Q is uh, is constant, but I will show you a, a bit later on that we can relax uh, we can relax that assumption. We, it can be variable, uh, and the qualitative results uh, will not change. Okay, and, and so just as we looked at the expected payoff from prospect P, we can do the same thing for the other prospect, P prime. Um, and so there's a raspberry bush, there's a blackberry bush, uh, which are far enough apart so that the bird can't keep its eye on both of them to see w where the fruit has ripened. Uh, the, um, the blackberries are better. They, they deliver more calories than the raspberries. Uh, but the problem is that they are expected to ripen later. Uh, but but uh, the idea is that uh, there's some chance that they will ripen early. Uh, and for now, I'm going to assume that, the, that this uh, density Q uh, is the same for both blackberries and raspberries. And we'll, we'll see later on that, again, we can relax that assumption. Uh, the densities 
don't have to be constant and they don't have to be the same uh, for, for both of the bushes, but there will, there will be some restrictions. You'll see that there are some restrictions on the probabilities of early arrival in order for this argument to go through. Yeah. Yeah, the, I, the idea is that you're not the only bird in town. Uh, there, there, there are a bunch of birds waiting for this bush to ripen, and if you're not there, the other birds are going to get the fruit, right? So that there, there will be birds at, at both bushes. Yes? We're going to assume that that uh, that these birds have uh, have uh, finite capacity. So so if if the uh, if the raspberries ripen earlier, the bird's going to eat its fill of those and won't be able to eat the the blackberries anymore. But but yes, yeah, so it, it would be an interesting complication to see what might happen if. Uh, the bird could could eat both both kinds. So so this is the the main result about um, about switching uh, uh, hyperbolic discounting like switching. Uh, suppose that. Uh, Suppose that the decision maker uh, at time zero uh, prefers the, uh, the blackberries to the raspberries. And suppo but suppose that there's an intermediate time, T star, where the, the decision maker is indifferent between the two prospects because the, the, the prospect because the chance of early arrival has uh, deteriorated so much. Then, at any later time, af after this time where the two prospects are of equal value, at any later time, the bird will prefer the early prospect, and at any earlier time, that is before T star, the bird will prefer the later prospect. So, there, so we get a single crossing effect where uh, P prime is initially preferred up to T star, and then from that point on, P is preferred to P prime. Are there, are there any questions about, about what this says? And as you'll see, the, the proof is pretty is pretty straightforward. And it's basically the intuition that I was giving uh, earlier. OK, so uh, really all we have to do is to write down the, uh, the expected payoffs from the two prospects. So, so uh, formula one is the pay off from the uh, from prospect P that those are the raspberries uh, at time T so not 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 necessarily at the uh, beginning of the of the story but at at some later time T uh, and formula two uh, is the same thing for the for the blackberries where um, we've updated the, uh, the probabilities, uh, the probability of, uh, of early uh, arrival given uh, that there hasn't been an arrival so far. Well, let's, let's take the 
time derivatives of both these payoffs. Uh, and those derivatives can be written in this form. And the interesting, the interesting thing uh, about these derivatives is that are just proportional to the payoffs themselves in, in one and two. And the payoffs themselves are assumed to be equal at T star. But then there is an additional term for both the raspberries and the blackberries, uh, which is negative and proportional to the corresponding payoffs, V and V prime. And it's these third terms that are going to matter, because at, at, at T star, where we're assuming that the two prospects are equally attractive, uh, first two terms are going to be equal. And so it's really just the third terms that are going to matter. Uh, this term is more negative than this term. In other words, the time derivative for the V prime prospect of the, v, of the P prime payoff is lower than the time derivative of the, uh, of the P prospect. Maybe I can draw this on the board. So uh, that's exactly the, the intuitive story that I, was, that I was giving before. Any, any questions about that argument? Is, is, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, now, there are two ways to think about this. Uh, one is that. Uh, the bird is told at the beginning, you have to decide once and for all, are you going to choose P prime or P? Uh, but then at some later time, uh, the bird is told, well, actually, if you want, uh, you, can, um, you can switch. Uh, and actually, th this is the way most of the experiments uh, were run. Uh, the, the bird made an, an initial choice. And then at some later point, it was given an opportunity uh, to, to choose the other prospect, to switch to the other prospect. Uh, but the other uh, 
The other interpretation, and this, and this would be uh, more appropriate for the, the, the setting that we've been thinking about, the blackberry bush and the raspberry bushes, that actually the decision maker could switch at any time, but uh, it's not going to switch until T star. It's going to stick with the later prospects. And then at T star, it will switch to the um, earlier prospect, uh, and it'll stick with the earlier prospect till the end. Now, I, uh, I should point out that we can equally well do this with, uh, with negative payoffs, the, uh, the, tax, the tax story, uh, same qualitative uh, result. Uh, I, I won't uh, go through the details of that, uh, but I, I did want to say a few words about relaxing the, the assumptions. Uh, so uh, I was assuming, uh, as, as the question uh, highlighted, that all early realization times are equally likely uh, and that they're the same for for both prospects, but we don't need either of those. Uh, and, and, and we also uh, don't have to rule out late arrival. I, I'm not going to talk about late arrival because that analysis is uh, essentially the same as what you've already seen. But uh, let, let me talk about uh, one and two. Um, the first thing to observe is that we uh, we do need some assumptions about early arrival. The, the, the density functions can't be completely arbitrary. And to see that, uh, let's suppose that we had these two prospects uh, and the uh, later prospect is initially more attractive and let's suppose that for some initial interval, that later prospect has a zero probability of being realized early. Uh, but, that, but that the other prospect, P, uh, does have a, a chance of being realized early. So we. We have this initial inter interval from zero to, to T naught. Uh, but notice that at T naught, the prospect P prime is no longer as attractive as it initially was because it, we didn't have any early arrival. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, p uh, it's prospect P that, that doesn't look as attractive as, as it once did because we didn't have any early arrival and P was expected to have at least some chance of early arrival initially. By contrast, uh, uh, P prime looks just the same as before because uh, we weren't expecting to have early arrival anyway. So if we, if we get to T naught, P prime looks just as good as before, P looks worse, and so uh, we don't switch from P prime uh, to P. So uh, we basically, we just have to rule this kind of thing out in order to get a proposition one like result. Uh, and to do that, uh, again, I, th I think I will skip the Most of the most of the details, but it's 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 this assumption that that it, that is critical. That is, uh, it it may be the case that uh, that the early that the early prospect at any given time has a, a higher probability of early arrival, but, uh, 
Butts. The early arrival probability for the later prospect multiplied by its bigger payoff, E prime, that exceeds the uh, early arrival uh, payoff times its payoff. In other words, uh, the, the density Q prime uh, might be low, but it's uh, but relative to Q, there's a limit to how low it can be. Uh, and, and not surprisingly, this depends on the payoffs. The bigger V prime is relative to V, uh, the lower Q prime can be. So, we can now redo Proposition 1 with these more uh, relaxed assumptions and get, and get the same conclusion. I think I will skip the example. But I've, I've been saying all along that this story about raspberry bushes and blackberry bushes is not the full story of hyperbolic discounting because we, yes, we get the switching, but we don't get the dynamic inconsistency. It, 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 it's perfectly rational for the bird to switch uh, once it's been disappointed by uh, persistent failure to get early arrival of payoffs. Uh, And another way of putting this is that a decision maker that a bird that could bind itself at time t not to switch at some future time um, would decline to do that because uh, it might actually be optimal for the bird to switch uh, later on. But that brings us to the uh, Stroat story about uh, Christmas accounts. Uh, Stroats noted that, the, that these were very popular. Pe people, millions of people put their money into these Christmas accounts despite the fact that these accounts were, uh, on the face of it, uh, very unattractive, no interest, uh, highly illiquid, uh, and uh, the fascinating thing is that uh, pigeons have their own uh, Christmas accounts. They, they, they learn uh, in some circumstances uh, not to switch from P prime to P. Uh, And they do this by getting around their urge to switch. OK, so uh, as I said at the outset, the, the, the way that we're going to explain dynamic inconsistency is to put our subjects into an environment for which they're uh, evolutionarily given preferences are not suitable. Uh, so, let's suppose that we put a, a bird into uh, a setting with two prospects uh, where, in fact, there's no probability uh, of early arrival. Um, well, then, uh, the bird doesn't know this or at least the bird doesn't know it at first, and so it, it behaves uh, as though it were in the, in the conventional setting, the, the, the setting for which its behavior evolved, and it will make the switch from P prime to P. Uh, but 
one, th one additional behavior that many species have, and, and this is especially true of pigeons and starlings, uh, is an ability uh, to adapt, to, to learn uh, about one's environment and to make behavioral adjustments. Uh, and suppose, suppose you as a bird uh, find yourself repeatedly in this situation where there's no early arrival. You see that there's no early arrival. Uh, you keep switching because that's what your uh, instincts tell you to do, uh, but uh, uh, after a time, uh, you, be you begin to wonder whether you're doing the right thing. Uh, and the problem, of course, is that if, if, you, if, if you try to reevaluate your be behavior, uh, your instincts are still saying switch, switch. So you, you somehow have to find a way around that urge. Uh, you might try to commit yourself somehow not to switch. And, and this brings us to this uh, evidence about pigeons. Uh, so, so here's how a lot of those pigeon experiments worked. Uh, there were two prospects with no probability of early arrival. And at some initial time, T1, the bird could make a choice uh, between the two prospects. And it did this by uh, pecking a key, de depressing a key with its, with its, with its beak. Um, and then at some later time, the pigeon was given the opportunity uh, to revise its decision and to uh, switch to the other prospect. There was also, and, and, and this is the crucial thing, a third key available, which if the pigeon pecked it at the beginning, at time T1, would disable the switching option at T2. So by pecking this key, the pigeon was in effect committing itself not to switch at T2. And, and, and here are the, uh, uh, the, stylized, uh, the, the, the stylized results. You, you can consult the, uh, th th there's actually a fairly large literature from the 70s on this. You can start by looking at Racklin and, and, Ais and Ainsley uh, as an as a, as a entry point into this literature. But uh, sure. It, uh, I, I think it was basically every trial, if I remember. It, it, it's been a while since I read the, read the papers, but I, I believe that it, uh, it could uh, always... It knows it can, it, it can change, uh, but it doesn't always change. That's, that's the interesting thing. Uh, it could change. It, 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 it has the opportunity to change at T2, uh, but it, it doesn't always change. And, and, you'll, and you'll see uh, when it changes and when it doesn't. So, so the first finding is that different pigeons make different decisions, as we might expect. There, there's, heter there's physiological heterogeneities, as, 
so some pigeons uh, uh, need calories uh, earlier than others. Uh, so some, uh, some pigeons choose the early prospect, some pigeons choose the late, pro the late prospect, but uh, over time, it, it, the, it, if, you, if you look at the same pigeon uh, in, repeated, uh, uh, in repeated experiments, uh, a given pigeon uh, normally makes the, the, the same choice in, in most grounds. Uh, furthermore, and, and, and th this gets to your question, if the pigeon chose the early prospect at time t1, it was uh, unlikely to switch to the late prospect at t2. Uh, but if it chose p prime, the probability of switching to the early prospect was, was, was uh, quite significant. Now I should say that, that uh, before the experiments began, uh, all of these pigeons went through a training program uh, where they, basically this was just to uh, let them know what the different keys could do. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and this is where learning uh, is important. Pigeons can learn, and, and, and they, they, they can learn in particular that the, the disabling key uh, really does disable the ability to, uh, to switch later on. <laughs> The short answer is yes. Uh, the, 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 the pigeons, uh, to, to the extent, of course, we can't uh, ask them questions, but we, we can see that their behavior was consistent. And, and so in, it was not, they were not behaving in, a, in, in random fashion. They were behaving in consistent fashion, so that suggests that they learned what these different keys did. Uh, now, th this, this is one of the, the most fascinating things. Uh, not all pigeons, in fact, mo many pigeons did not peck the disabling key. Uh, but the ones who chose the later prospect were much more likely to pick the disabling key. If you, if you chose the bigger payoff, the later and bigger payoff, you were more likely to commit yourself not to switch away from that. Uh, and I, I also want to stress point three here. Uh, pigeons did not tend to uh, commit themselves in, in early rounds. So a, 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 a given pigeon had to wait and see what happened before it was willing to commit itself. So it, furthermore, once a pigeon who ch chose P prime uh, started disabling itself, committing itself, uh, it would continue to do so. So this was not, a, again, a, uh, a haphazard behavior. It was a consistent behavior. So how do we make sense of these findings? Uh, well, the fact that, that, the pigeon, that a given pigeon would tend to make the same choices uh, suggests that preferences were fairly stable and that the bird was trying to advance some sort of objective uh, in its behavior, uh, perhaps discounted calories, and since, since the reward was food, uh, uh, seeds. 
uh, the, uh, the second finding, uh, w which was uh, that we got switching from P prime to P, but not future biased behavior from P to P prime. Uh, that's consistent with our, with our model in, in, in which switching from P prime to P makes sense uh, if you are expecting some chance of early payoffs and, and then are disappointed. Uh, so why didn't we see uh, pigeons committing themselves immediately? Well, as far as the pigeon knew, it was in, a, in the sort of setting that it was used to, where there, there was some chance of early realization, in which case switching from P prime to P would make sense. It took time for these pigeons to learn that the setting um, w was atypical. There was no probability of early realization. Uh, In the training phase, there were there were no there were no cues. Uh, that is, there there was no probability of early arrival in in any of the training but or or in the experiments themselves. The, the, this is a point I'm going to come back to. The, there are some more experiment so so, some more experiments that should be done which haven't been done. <laughs> You, you would expect that, and, but that, that was not examined, that, and, and that would be, that would be a great follow-up question. The, 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 the problem is that these experiments were all done a long time ago, uh, before various theories for why hyperbolic discounting should occur were even developed. So, so in particular, my work with Das Gupta came years after the pigeon experiments. It suggests that there are some more experiments that could be done that would be very revealing. And, and uh, in particular, varying Q would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, but uh, to my knowledge, um, the, uh, these experiments have not, have not been pursued for the most part. Anyway. Um, it does take a while for pigeons to realize that, that, the, that this uh, uh, experiment is atypical, um, uh, but then once they catch on and they do commit themselves, it's, it's the ones who were choosing P prime and then switching to P who are availing themselves of the commitment device, the other the other pigeons don't peck, the uh, don't peck the third key. So um, so I I I find this this evidence really quite uh, quite striking, uh, but the, 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 there there are some more things which should be done, which I'll get to in a minute. Question back there. Yeah.
Yeah, that, that's a good question, and, and I wish we could ask the pigeons to, to get an answer. I mean, you, 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 might, uh, you might guess that, uh, that it's additional flexibility. That is, if I choose P prime, uh, while it seems as though there's no early arrival, uh, maybe I'll get lucky and there, and there will be early arrival, and, and if there's not, well, I can always switch to P anyway. So, so, so uh, Wait a second. Uh, if if you learn from experience, I, I I think I just misspoke a moment ago. If you find out from experience that you're not going to get early arrival, uh, that Christmas is not going to come early, uh, but you still want to save for Christmas, then your best option is to. Choose P prime, right? Not P. You want you want P prime, and and, and that's exactly what the birds did. They, the the birds wanted the higher payoff of P prime. They but they realized that they weren't going to be able to stick with this choice, uh, and they especially wanted to stick with the choice because there was no probability of early arrival anyway. Okay, so, I, uh, so, so what I, 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 I said at first in answer to your question uh, was wrong. Uh, the, 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 the pigeons behave just, just like the humans in the same situation. They, they, they wanted to commit them, they, they wanted the higher payoffs from the long term prospect. They knew that they were likely to be weak-willed when the time came, and so they disabled that, uh, that opportunity to, uh, to cave in to the early payoff. That's right. That, that, that's, that's right. Uh, if, if the payoffs from P prime are, uh, are big enough, then, uh, then, I want to, uh, then I want to commit to, to P prime, uh, even though there's no early arrival. 